It was late on a Saturday night, and Dad, Mom, and I were leaving the home of our family friends a few miles from our home in Georgetown, Kentucky. It was extremely dark, but we could see that it had rained because the street looked a little wet and the grass had rain droplets on it. We were all smiles as we hopped in the car, reminiscing on the new memories that we created with our friends, and then we started our drive home. Within less than a minute, I heard my dad say from the driver's seat, I can't see the road anymore. Within seconds, we figured out why as the front tires splashed in the water, then the rear tires. The tires were quickly submerged. As the water crept up, I heard the engine go from a strong hum to a low, deep growl. Water was starting to seep into the car and was puddling beneath our feet. Panic set in. We couldn't turn around. In fact, Dad no longer had full control of the car. He began looking desperately for solutions. I looked out of the rear passenger window beside me. Instead of solutions, I saw my 12-year-old reflection. On the other side of the window, I saw water creeping up. In my reflection, it was at my chin. Panic turned into fear. Then the water was at the same level of my nose. And fear turned into terror when I saw the water go over my head in the reflection. We were terrified. This was an entire family in a car, a dad, a mom, and their only child, and all of our hopes and dreams facing the immediate threat of death. As we searched desperately for a solution, we noticed a driveway nearby. This was our only hope. Somehow the floodwaters guided us to that driveway and dad was able to regain control of the car and turn the car up the driveway. From there, we watched the floodwaters for hours until about 3 a.m. They were higher than the mailbox at that house. The next day, we shared the story with our friends and they explained that that happens every time there's a heavy downpour, saying that you can't get into or out of their neighborhood when that happens. They even shared a similar experience of being trapped in the floodwaters on the same street with their kids in car seats. Mom and I were on that street recently and she pointed out a cross on the side of the road near our incident and she explained that a woman had gotten trapped in the floodwaters a couple weeks before and didn't make it. They found her car the next day. Climate change is causing more frequent and more intense flooding events. This increases our risk of illness, injury, and death. Floodwaters can leave mold in our homes, workplaces, and schools. Floodwaters can also contaminate our drinking and recreational waters. This puts communities like that of our friends in Georgetown at greater risk. But adaptation activities can help protect us from the immediate dangers. For example, environmental health practitioners can work with planners to make flood prone communities more resilient. Environmental health practitioners can develop vulnerability assessments to identify areas of greater risk and plan accordingly. They can team with planners to incorporate designs that can better handle stormwater runoff, including developing greenways to protect streams and floodplains, allowing stormwater to soak into the ground. I don't know why my family was spared that night, perhaps for this moment, for me to put a human face on climate change, for me to share the urgency of action needed to protect our communities and our families who are filled with hopes and dreams of a bright future. I've heard it said by many environmental health leaders that we are the first generation to feel the health impacts of climate change and the last that can do something about it. But there is much that we can do about it. And we can do it with the skills and expertise of the environmental health workforce and through partnering with researchers across disciplines and with communities.